We are talking to Les Bartlett. Les is a Cape Ann historian and an artist. And Les has been working on the 1918 pandemic and what it looked like on Cape Ann. So Les, tell us what you've learned. Yeah, it, it really is a case of learning, Heather and Corey, because there were no people to talk to. There are very limited articles that have been written. And what has come out, particularly in the light of COVID-19, has typically been, uh, in a nutshell, one photograph of white tents at Addison Gilbert Hospital, and then some text related to that. Well, in 2012 at Sandy Bay, there was a wonderful presentation put together by Deborah Legg and Gwen Stevenson on the Leonard Haskins Hospital on Summit Hill in Rockport. So I thought it'd be really kind of interesting to see and profile how did the two hospitals, Addison Gilbert and Gloucester and Haskins Hospital in Rockport respond to the epidemic, which was so quick to hit, hit the Cape Ann. And there's very different parts to the story. There were no hospitals on Cape Ann as late as 1884. If you were sick, the doctor came to your house. If you could live to get to his office, wherever it might be, you did it, and that was it. It was the Cape Ann advertiser in October of 1884 that said, we need a hospital. There's a hospital in Beverly, there's one in Salem, there's one in Ipswich. And it took the death of Addison Gilbert, who was a wonderful philanthropist and businessman in Gloucester in 1888, who in his will, leave $100,000 for the establishment of a permanent brick building to be named the Gilbert Building, with his wish to be that there would be 30 hospital beds uh, to be provided for the residents of Gloucester at no charge. Now, what then got established from this with that donation was a private business group. And so from the beginning, the Addison Gilbert Hospital was a privately run business. And it was tough because you had men who were the trustees who knew the bottom line and who business, but who not, knew nothing about medical practice. And so there was a friction between the trustees and the matron who was the go-between between between them and the medical staff as to how they were going to run the operation. They very quickly changed the charter to say, yeah, the beds are free, but if you can afford to pay, we really prefer that you afford to pay. By 1905-1906, the Gloucester Hospital, formed and supported by the city of Gloucester, comes into existence. Um, the women of, of Gloucester start to raise through fundraising for it. The fishermen contribute as well as they can to it. And meanwhile, the Addison Gilbert Hospital sits as, as a white uh, castle on the grounds by itself. Rockport in 1905 is given the land of Leonard Haskins, who was a doctor, who upon his deathbed said, I will give this land to Rockport and I wish them to build a hospital for themselves. And so from the beginning, the Leonard Haskin Hospital was owned by the town of Rockport, which meant that they had to come up with the funds to maintain it, to pay for the furnace, to pay for the hospital staff, uh, to make it all work. And so the Women's Auxiliary Group of Rockport was incredibly strong. And I found a, a list of over 160 names of women who were having fundraisers at every time of the year to raise money because they had to pay for every part of the hospital's operation in it. This included uh, restaurant, uh, dances at night, uh, health fairs, choreographed histories of Rockport, where the summer residents would attend. And it was such a long established tradition that by 1916, 1917, those fundraisers were being actually led by younger women in Rockport who had learned choreography, who had learned dance, and were able to put on performances. All of this came into play very importantly because the hospital closes in 1917 for a simple reason in Rockport. The furnace kept breaking and they had no money to repair it. Through all the graces and luck, it's in February of 1918 that they get the furnace replaced. And so that positions Rockport for what's about to take place with the epidemic of 1918. And Gloucester is still Addison Gilbert Hospital. The trustees are still fighting over who gets to use the hospital beds. Before Rockport had his hospital, Rockport petitioned, can we send patients to Gloucester? And Gloucester said, no, you may not. So the flu comes, in, comes back to the United States with the returning soldiers, and it comes back with a vengeance and, and a speed that uh, 
there was no internet, there was no smartphone then. It was the people were be bewildered by what was taking place. There, there's a, a, a wonderful little um, children's rhyme that I came across. And, and the beginning of it is a man saying, the idea that you could wake up in the morning and be healthy and by night be dead, you couldn't think of that. And the children's nursery rhyme is, I had a little bird and its name was Enza. I opened my window and in flew Enza, et cetera, et cetera. Which seems innocuous enough, you know, but there's a deadly realism to that. Um, I went online this morning to say, okay, when did this epidemic end? And it ended because by the summer of 1919, you were either dead or you had become immune to it. I guess that would be the herd immunity that we hear being thrown about and talked about. Um, so the military comes back, the soldiers are getting sick. They need to be taken care of. Um, it's, a, it's a military problem. And it's exacerbated by the fact that the, the most qualified nurses are over in Europe. The United States shipped over 9,000 trained nurses to Europe, which meant that in terms of Cape Ann, there were very few trained nurses to deal with this onslaught of this flu. It's further compounded that many of the more wealthy people, not just on Cape Ann, but Cape Ann and through the Boston area, throughout the New England area, had the services of private doctors and private physicians. And the Boston Globe carried articles where they were being entreated to see if they could allow their, their physicians to get, get a few hours a day to help. Okay? And help very quickly became uh, the theory that the best way to treat this, this epidemic was to have outdoor fresh air. And Gloucester and Rockport benefited from sea breezes. That was very helpful. So the tent city in Addison Gilbert was set up, and the tent city at Rockport Haskins Hospital was set up. Unfortunately, there still was the need for nurses. And what came to the rescue were incredibly trained nurses from Canada, from Halifax and Hamilton, who came down into the Boston area, came to Gloucester, came to Rockport. And they were the stalwarts of the support and the treatment for all of the uh, soldiers and citizens, because this became, so, you know, by the end of the end of 1918, over 900 people had died in Cape Ann. And one of the questions is, well, where were they buried? How, how were, you know, where are their graves? And my feeling is that many of the graves were just dug out in the back of the house and the bodies were quietly laid to rest in it. One of the great hidden strengths of the women's auxiliaries is what happened with high school aged girls who offered their time 12, 14 hours a day as volunteer nurses, as nurses aides. And this was a big step. There were no, in 1918, there were no professional training programs for nurses aides. You had the, the, the decorum and the structure of trained nurses who were making money. So that was something that had to be contended with. Also the Canadian nurses, were commissioned officers in the army. Um, they had the rank of lieutenant, which meant they were to be saluted by any soldiers who were of lesser rank. Um, a very different kind of interplay between the helpers and those who need the assistance in it. So, and it happened so quickly, you know, in August of 1918, the, the uh, Rockport baseball team was beating all the teams on Cape Ann in the North Shore and the Gloucester Boy Scouts were organizing and making all the preparations for their nighttime fundraising circus, which took place. And then September hit. So the pandemic has great parallels to what we're dealing with now. But there's also this, I, I feel that the, the, the virus is a pandemic, but the larger pandemic is how we forget. And the lesson here is that we're, we're very well trained to automatically forget what we forgot. You know, this morning that someone actually put on a line of Facebook, well, what about 1918 epidemic without even knowing I was going to be talking? And someone said, well, it's the same old news again. It's the same old story again. So I think part of the research that's made it a different story is the strength and resilience of the women of KBM. Mm -hmm. This is all pre-suffering. So this is like an extraordinary event. Um, yeah, that's been my research. It's amazing. It really is. It's a very moving story. Um, to see these communities coming together. So thank you so much, Les. Corey, any questions? What do you got? No, I, well, Les, can we follow up with you with different aspects of the um, the pandemic from then? And I mean, we should be doing this with you weekly anyway about um, yeah, sure. this <laughs> to the area. Yeah, we'd love okay. to. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, let's do it again. Okay, okay. thank you, Les, for your thank time. You for be well, Bye -bye. Les. Bye-bye.